Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Today, we'll be getting into some dramatic stories with Apple and Boats and revisiting YouTube DL, as well as some cool exploits, including the Ubuntu root privilege escalation that made the rounds last week. This episode will probably be shorter than past episodes. Uh, we're going to experiment with some shorter episodes and limiting how deep we dive into some exploits. Uh, we will also be asking for some feedback this week, as well as uh, next week, we may be putting up a forum or something like that. Um, but we set up a channel in our Discord called uh, Podcast Feedback, and we'd appreciate any feedback that uh, any of you may want to throw in there. Um, types of feedback that would be helpful is what parts you find interesting, what parts do you like skip over and kind of tune out on, uh, and basically where we could optimize and cut stuff out to have a more concise podcast that still adds value. So, yeah. Anybody who is uh, willing to add feedback, we would really appreciate that. And uh, once again, that's in our Discord. With that out of the way, I think we can jump into some news. So uh, getting some some interesting stuff from Apple again. So Apple allegedly did not credit a researcher that reported an issue. So this was Lior Halfon on Twitter. Um, they said, if you ever find a vulnerability in an Apple product, do yourself a favor and exploit it in a jailbreak or sell it to a shady company instead of reporting it. Apple uh, fixed the vulnerability I reported, and not only did they not reward a bounty, they didn't even add a credit. So he shows a screenshot of some back and forth between uh, them and Apple. Um, yeah, saying any update I see, security content has been released, but no mention of neither the report nor me. Um, and then they basically said thank you for letting us know uh cves are assigned closer to the release security update which releases the issue which is weird because according to the researcher this was already fixed uh in the security release for big sur so that seems like kind of a, a runaround response from apple yeah it um, definitely does seem like a bit of a runaround it also just feels like possibly just the person who's kind of answering this email just wasn't really aware of kind of the core issue or whatever like it maybe got bounced around somebody else handled it something like that um it does oh no so i don't associate apple with having a really bad reputation on this front um not a great reputation because they are a little bit closed off when it comes to researchers they don't give a lot of access a lot of useful access but like i don't really associate them with trying to scam people have you had that sort of association with apple so there, there's been some stuff that's happened in the past that hasn't looked awesome on Apple. Um, I mean, one that I brought up before was the the one with QWERTY. I think he reported an issue and he wanted Apple to, instead of paying out to him, pay out to a like a charity that he listed. It was like an MDMA research thing for uh, combat veterans for PTSD, I think, or something like that. Right, and, um, I do remember and that. And they refused to pay out to that charity because they didn't agree with it. But it's like, it was his payout. It was his money. You know, he submitted the bounty, so Apple should have respected that. So there's definitely been some stuff in the past that has pointed towards them not being at the same very time, friendly to researchers. Um, at the one that he just mentioned, at the same time, like he could have or he possibly could have taken the bounty himself and donated it to that company if Apple wasn't willing to do so directly. Yeah, I'm not sure why he wanted Apple to do it directly. It might have been some like tax reasons or something. I I, I don't know. I don't that think I ever worry. asked about that. I don't know where he works. It could have been something related to work related, preventing him from actually taking or accepting bounties. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure on the specifics of that, but, um, but in yeah. general, like I don't generally know if Apple is trying to scam the researchers. It sounds like you're saying some things that I'm not aware of. Like I haven't really paid too much attention to Apple. I'm not really an Apple product user. I haven't really dived in or, done any sort of deep look at like ios internals or anything so it's definitely possible i've just missed it but as a legitimate company it does feel more likely to me that this is just kind of a miscommunication case rather than an attempt to scam you did mention that um or i'm not i actually i don't recall if you mentioned it right here a few minutes ago but i know you brought up previously uh, that Apple may end up adding the credit in the future. Yeah, uh, but mostly just because of this, or possibly because of this Twitter chain. Exactly. Um, it, it seems he might be credited, but it it seems like it's one of those 
Twitter mob reply things where they probably wouldn't if there wasn't a bit of a little bit of a PR storm around it. It doesn't look like a huge mob here in this case. You know, 51 retweets, 182 likes isn't exactly huge. That said, like, I do think it's clear that this liar guy is trying to stir something up. I mean, you know, don't waste your time on their scam. Like, he's very much trying to rile people off to, out against And, and encouraging selling to shady sources. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not a good faith mention here. Like, he's clearly trying to stir up the Twitter mob. And while it, it may not have, like, a ton of likes and retweets, um, it did get liked and shared by the security community who is, like, researchers who do Apple stuff, like, full-time. So as much as maybe it didn't get as much reach as the numbers themselves might suggest, it did reach, like, the right people and people who I mean, um, we're talking are influential about it, in that so space. So. It, at least, it at least got some reach out of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it, it's just Apple in general, like, I, I really don't know why they haven't updated their security stance by this point. Like, I think the fact that they don't have a mature public bounty program, considering it's Apple, is, like, extremely ridiculous. Like, ex like Apple is arguably the most important company to have good security because you have iPhones, they make computers, they, like, a lot of product, they have a lot of market share in the in the phone space and in even in like the laptop space with macbooks and stuff and yet they unlike microsoft or google they they have like no bounty program it's just it doesn't really make sense to me or they do have a bounty program but it's private and hidden off and if you're not in apple's good graces you're not getting anywhere it's almost like nintendo in that way um i just i don't really know why it's 2020 and they they still like can't be bothered to really update that stance um yeah and that part is kind of what i was referring to when i said how apple isn't really open to the researchers earlier it was just the fact that you know they don't have a they're not supportive of people doing research it seems more like they begrudgingly allow it at some points and yeah. i mean i do agree i think they should open that up a lot more um give more information to researchers uh there are some arguments to be made over whether or not research should be uh, so open. Actually, that's kind of our, our next topic. Ends up touching on that. But, I mean, at least Apple isn't uh, being too hostile towards the researchers. It's more just not supportive of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think if it wasn't for... Pro, uh teams like project zero apple probably might have more of an open security stance because they would probably have to i think apple security is like majorly propped up by project zero to an insane degree and i think that might give them the arrogance to think that they they don't need a bounty program or something right so well, like i said they do have a private bounty program so that is or not something. a public one yeah i should i should have phrased that better my bad yeah well it's just like, I think there is value in the private one, too, being able to limit who's kind of doing their being able because we've talked about terrible reports out of bounty programs. Yeah, I mean, that that is a fair point. Uh, some of the reports we've seen have just been flooding triage queues, so I can see why Apple would want to avoid that. that. That's a fair point. But anyway, I do hope that Apple at least somewhat... <sighs> changes their security stance in the near future but uh, i'm not holding out any hope it is apple after all uh, so they, don't, they don't really care what people think generally I don't know the answer to this but um prismo and chad asked what's the barrier to entry for private versus public um and i assume he's talking about the apple bounty here like do you know what the barrier is for getting onto the apple private bounty um i definitely don't know that offhand I would think it's more networking based. Like you, you probably have to have contacts with people who are already in it or contacts at Apple directly. And you probably have to have some of somewhat of an established background as a security researcher. Um, probably have to have like some, some issues yeah, you that's... can point to or write ups or something like that. Speculation. Um, so we don't know that's speculation. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, saying we don't know. Offhand. Like set um, can probably find it off Google, but yeah, we don't know offhand. Yeah. Um, 
And Apple is one of those companies where if you don't play ball and you like, let's say you were like Saguza was a few years ago and you dropped an O day against Mac, you're you're probably not getting into their program. Uh, they can be vindictive like that, so they they probably look at stuff like that too. Um, that said, we we can move into votes, like you were saying uh, earlier. Uh, we have a response to a Supreme Court amicus brief by votes. If votes sounds familiar to you. Um, to some of you who have been listening to us for a while, that's because we've talked about votes before. Uh, they're a company who researched using blockchain to ensure the integrity of voting in elections. Well, uh, not we just talked about... researched. Um, like, they established this. They were using it for voting for military and overseas voters with West Virginia. Um, and we talked about them in episode 29, and that's where uh, MIT kind of did this offline research. Or offline security assessment of their application, and then Trail of Bits did another assessment in episode 34. Yeah, and uh, that initial assessment was uh, episode 29 as well. Yeah, the MIT one. So our coverage of them overall wasn't super positive. Um, they have had a history of treating security researchers badly. When we first talked about them in episode 29, uh, it was stated that they ostracized and treated the... Uh, was it MIT or Uni University of Michigan? Because our, or I think it was MIT research, uh, but was... an independent researcher from University of Michigan tried to so, research uh, it and uh, was basically ostracized by votes and was treated of. as a malicious um, actor. Yes. Trias, uh, so I was going to get into that later. But yeah, so okay. episode 29, we were talking about the MIT case. Um, MIT referenced some votes hostility, uh, but it was an MIT doing their assessment. And they kind of did their whole assessment in a really weird way. Uh, they looked at the application, but they didn't make any requests to the actual votes backend. Um, and we commented on how that was a little bit weird, but votes um, as part of their, at the time they had a Hacker One program. They've since been removed from Hacker One. Uh, but at the time, the votes policy basically limited you. Like you couldn't actually hit their live applications. You couldn't do any of that. So that's kind of all the MIT researchers were allowed to do was look at the a phone app and make assumptions and votes kind of defended themselves by arguing well they just assumed how the server was going to respond and then our follow-up when we had the trail of bits look at it's like nope mit was right these are issues and um, they couldn't confirm it votes lied about it and kind of went from there so where university of michigan comes in is the hostility that mit refer to is that University of Michigan has a election security course. And as part of research during that course, a student of that course ended up assessing one of uh, one of the votes uh, supported election, like one of, one of the elections that you could use votes for. Uh, I kind of agree with votes, though, on this one. Uh, so what votes did was they saw the malicious activity hitting a live election in 2018. Uh, they saw these attempts and they reported it to their client, the state of West Virginia, who then reported it to the FBI. And Votes makes this argument in their amicus brief. So I guess we've started talking about votes going into all this. This brief is in response to an attempt to get the CFAA uh, to offer some protections for security researchers. Uh, kind of the protections like we've talked about before, CFA is really broad. We can, there are a lot of activities that will, that you might do in good faith and you're just doing security research and find yourself violating um, CFAA as just unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access, sorry, not disclosure to a security or to a computer system. Uh, so uh, this amicus brief is basically in response to that attempt where votes is was called out for their hostility and as an example of why you know we need protections for researchers. Uh, so votes defends themselves by pointing out that they only reported it to West Virginia, who then reported up to the FBI. It was done against an actual election. Um, you know, live data, like an actual event ongoing. And the researcher did not seek any sort of prior authorization before doing it. Now, in this paper, they kind of talk about 
or not this paper, in this little article or letter, they do mention how the researcher showed up and protected and didn't need, um, didn't need to get permission. Uh, they call out the DMCA Act there, which I'm not a lawyer. It seems like people much smarter than I am are kind of on this, but it does seem like this research really doesn't doesn't fit under co violating copyright and like the DMCA exception they refer to is just the fact that um, security research can be performed and can go around copyrights basically uh, like you're allowed to do that under DMCA for good faith security research if it is necessary and as long as you follow the terms and agreements that you've laid out for actually accessing and using the software uh, again I'm not a lawyer but I don't see the exact connection here on that authorization and where it comes into the CFAA here. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember if you clarified it, but I'll just say uh, CFAA, for those not familiar, uh, C Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Yeah. Yeah, and we've talked about before, it's, it is just, it's really vaguely written and it does create problems for research. So, like, I agree with this in general that there needs to be more support and more uh yeah i guess more support for security researchers to be able to look at systems especially something like an, an election system i mean this is absolutely some that should have security research done on it and votes is hostile towards that i'm not sure i entirely agree with the outrage against their response uh to the a University of Michigan student. You think this is a bit biased? I it's... feel like that point, at least, like a lot of like a lot of people point to that hostility, and I mean the thing is, like votes, if they don't know somebody's actually assessing their election system at the time, what does what do those requests look like to their operations center? It looks like a malicious attacker, which is exactly what they did and reported. Now, I don't know if there is some mitigating factor, like he did contact them and got no response, or if, if there was something else in there. I may not have all the details, but given what I have seen, I mean, it, that is one of the issues that is basically going to be the case with any system. If they just... Uh, so what the original brief, like what they're wanting is to open up CFA so good faith research is protected. Just outright, you can do security research on whatever you want. And the thing is, that creates so many problems for actually detecting breaches if it could be a legitimate researcher who just hasn't contacted or let you know or done anything like that. I can totally see that causing problems on the threat intel side of things, yeah. Yeah, so it's not that I disagree that researchers need more protection it's just this doesn't seem like the right solution um and calling out votes here is acting in bad faith like votes has issues we've talked about that like not allowing you know like what i think the solution here is votes should have a test environment for people to test in you know like paypal has their sandbox you can do some testing and they have numbers that you can use to assess the like, the credit card system in there they have a way for you to do the assessment without necessarily hitting the live production system. I mean, I think that's more what votes should be doing rather than just fighting back on it's totally fine. Yeah, they should have public test servers. Yeah. Um, now, one point I did want to touch on, uh, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier when you were talking about um, the safe harbor was they have a, a quote in their response that says uh, boats took action uh, purporting to offer a safe harbor as part of its bug bounty program, which stated at the time of the student's testing that any activities conducted in a matter consistent with the policy would be considered authorized conduct, and we would not le initialize legal action against you. Um, shortly after news of that incident became public, they retroactively updated their safe harbor to disallow the student's activity. So there are a few like points that they have in here that, if taken it at face value, and if they're not you know obscuring some detail, um, is like does make votes look really bad here. Uh, like there was another one where the company stated they reported the student because they didn't seek any prior authorization, which you already mentioned. Um, but like like I said in that past quote, you know, 
they authorize any mem member of the public to report vulnerabilities without needing to seek that prior authorization. That's kind of the point of the bounty program. Yes, so, but reporting a vulnerability, like, so that's kind of the point of your vulnerability uh, disclosure program is having a way for people to report the vulnerability without needing to worry about it. That doesn't actually yeah. mean you can test. It just means you can report. It's only kind of half the problem. It's only the vulnerability disclosure that's, Kind of allowed there, not, not, not necessarily the actual testing. Um. So, like I said, it's like you can have a vulnerability disclosure program that allows you to test whatever you want within, um, the test environment. You do it against a live server. It's not authorized. Or you go beyond and like pull out certain information. Now, I don't know. I guess what the actual terms would have been at the time of that student. Like if. If it was not kind of what we had read when we looked at votes the first time, uh, where we kind of pulled up their program information, if that had changed, then yeah, like if they're changing uh, uh, vulner or if they're changing their policy in response to uh, somebody doing something they didn't like and then holding them accountable to the new program, you know, that's clearly hostility, and maybe I just didn't see that. Yeah, that, that's what I was kind of getting at. With like, I I can totally see what you're saying with the uh, discovery and the reporting being two different phases. Um, but like, yeah, the fact that they retroactively updated it—that's the point that I think is is uh, is worth calling out. Um, but overall, like, what I'd say as like a final point is, it seems messed up that their company and their research is based on security, um, security of votes yet they're not willing to play ball with the security community by setting up something like a public test server. That just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Why yeah, would I mean, you I'm start up a security company those. if you're not going to, you know, try to make it secure by playing with the security community? It just seems antithetical to what they're trying to do. So, yeah, it just seems weird to me. Well, they um, do. So they do mention how they do work with private contractors like they do get assessments and fix what's found and make sure it's up to uh, th they mentioned some standard. I don't recall what it is, but like they do that, which is fair. But um, especially when it comes to voting, public one, especially no, when it comes to voting, you want that public transparency and public trust in in, in its security. So. I agree. You want that. And I agree. Like, I'm not like, even if votes were to change right now, I would not be quick to trust them whatsoever. Yeah. Partially because I like, I mean, one blockchain, <laughs> you know, it just seems a little <laughs> bit like going for the buzzword. I'm not sure it's really the right problem to put the blockchain on. But yeah, I, I can't really, just because of how Votes has acted, I can't really trust them. I do think there's a little bit of misleading information out there, and it's possible that I've just succumbed to that. It's possible that this article has. I, I do think, like, there's some information that's just missing in a lot of the reporting, either very pro-Votes or very against that. Yeah, I, I think the, the best way of summing up that article and some of the points that you had was it's not as cut and dry as uh, these the, the article may have you believe. There's a lot more nuances to the situation, especially around the CFAA, than uh, they're willing to give credit for, I think. So, keeping on the legal uh, section, we have YouTube DL coming back. So last time we talked about YouTube DL, uh, we talked about it on episode 50. Uh, it had been taken down from GitHub, mostly uh, on the grounds that some of their tests, uh, their unit tests, used music video URLs uh, that were the the music was copyrighted. So when we talked about that, we talked about DMCA a little bit and how companies basically had to comply with them unless they were certain that they were false or received information that showed that they were they would not hold up that they could reverse later. Uh, well, that's happened, it seems. Uh, YouTube DL has been put back up after a reversal request was sent by the Electronic Frontier Foundation on YouTube DL's behalf. Um, their their argument was basically the fact that unit tests don't suggest it's used to copy or distribute reference songs and argued that when it came to bypassing uh, YouTube's signature code, um, that YouTube DL basically acted as a browser. Um, so I, I believe those unit tests and anything that referenced those music video URLs were taken down and then... Uh, by the repo owners, and then GitHub reinstated the repository. Uh, so that takedown was reversed. Um, 
But along with that, and more importantly, I think GitHub announced they're making some changes to the 1201 claim review process for DMCAs. So I think some of the, the highlighting points there are all claims going forward will be reviewed and scrutinized by both technical and legal experts. Um, and in ambiguous cases, they'll err on the side of the developer instead of on the side of the claimer, uh, which I think is, is unique. Most other platforms go the other way. Uh, when the claim is found to be legal, they'll contact the repo owner and give them a chance to respond or modify the repo to avoid uh, or to have the repo reinstated or avoid the takedown. Um, and even when the repo is taken down, our repository owners still have that communication channel with GitHub staff and GitHub staff will continue to reach out and, and try to uh, get that repo back online. So I think these are some bold steps from GitHub. Um, Another thing worth calling out is they're also going to be donating a million dollars to the Developer Defense Fund uh, to protect developers from unwarranted takedowns. Um, there is even more stuff that they're doing here, and uh, you can look at the blog posts if you're interested in some of the other stuff. But basically, it seems GitHub really is taking a stand here. Uh, I originally thought their headline was going to be over dramatic. Uh, you know, standing up for developers has a very like Hollywood esque theme to it. Um, but it, it actually fits the bill here. Um, I, I kind of hope this will shut up all the people who have been reading about, uh, at GitHub for like the last month about this. Um, there's been a lot of people mad at GitHub unfairly, in my opinion. I think GitHub really got the short end of the stick with the YouTube DL situation. Um, and hopefully with these new stances, people will start to see that and start to give GitHub more of a benefit of the doubt in, in future situations. Um, would be nice. I mean, I feel like GitHub, when they sold to Microsoft, kind of lost a ton of goodwill from the community in general. Yeah, people have been and, hard on them ever since, for sure. Yeah, just because Microsoft feels like part of it. And in this case, so I definitely kind of defended the DMCA request a little bit, saying that, like, so to be clear, I'm not a fan of the DMCA. Um, I don't like support it, but I could at least see the argument for YouTube DL because of the fact they had the test code. So I am glad that it seems like just removing that code was sufficient because I thought it was kind of going to be a case of, you know, the bad apple spoiling the bunch where they have the one case that kind of shows the tool's intent. Um, and I don't know, maybe there will be a counterclaim on this and it will actually go further in court or whatever. I am worried about that. I was thinking about that when I was reading through this. I'm like, I wonder if we'll see something against GitHub, like if this will backfire in the in the legal system. Well, no, but it only necessarily time will tell need that. to backfire. Like, I believe the counterclaim, um, so both from the developer and then if the copyright holder does so again, like, I believe that is part of the standard process. Like, it doesn't go immediately to court. So, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be against GitHub yet, but against the developer. As far as I understand, we're getting into the legal side of things, which is not our area of expertise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like basically my like thoughts on this are they, they don't have to take these stances. They could be like everybody else, like uh, like YouTube, for example, where if they receive a DMCA, they just they operate on it. They take it uh, at face value and you're really kind of stuck as the uh receiver of the dmca claim or the takedown um so yeah I, github really didn't have to take this stance i think this is a kind of a risk that they're taking on their side which uh, i think people should you know commend and and appreciate because uh, yeah, they definitely for sure. i didn't this. i didn't say that before for myself but yeah like i i do appreciate the move that github's taking here and i agree with you that they are taking at least a bit of a risk on their own side uh, by improve by like being willing to just default to the developers instead of the copyright holder being kind of a good example of that i do wonder like it's i don't know how common the 1201 takedowns are maybe not that common but it does sound like they're adding a lot of overhead onto that to have it scrutinized by legal experts and technical experts yeah yeah as well as the uh the, the donation as well for the the defense fund um, but yeah, this gives me confidence in uh, some of the repo repositories I have up, notably the uh, the PS4 toolchain. There's always been a little bit of a legal concern in the back of my head. Uh, we don't have any like pirated materials in the repository, but it would 
potentially be in the interest of Sony to to take down that repo to not let people write their own homebrew if they wanted to go that route. Um, so yeah, this does give me a little bit more confidence in, in some of the projects that I'm running as well. So yeah, I really appreciated this post. With that said, we can move into uh, some bounties. Uh, first, we have a Hacker One bounty for Dropbox, uh, which is interesting because I think this might be the first time we've covered drop a Dropbox report on the uh, on the podcast. You know, but I'm not was... actually sure about that. Um, yeah, I didn't I actually go through and covered. check, but I don't I don't recall any recently anyway. Yeah, no, episode 15, it looks like we might have covered. No, sorry. I just did a keyword search and saw episode 15, but it, it wasn't Dropbox. Yeah, I think this is our first time, actually. Yeah. So um, Hacker One actually has a, a pretty, or rather Dropbox has a pretty lucrative bounty uh, program on Hacker One. Um, so Z, I, I know you found this one interesting, so uh, I'll let you jump into this one. Well, it's more just one point that I want to call out on this one rather than the whole exploit being interesting. So it's a server side request forgery leading to the AWS private key disclosure, um, among other things. Basically, they got access to that metadata API so they could access anything in there, including tokens and keys and all of that. Uh, where the issue comes from, you're able to. In, in Hello Sign, so we kind of mentioned Dropbox, but this is uh, Dropbox owns Hello Sign. Uh, so it's in the Hello Sign application. You're able to import a document from Dropbox, G Drive, Box, OneDrive, or Evernote. Um, you're able to. Sorry, so when it does that, there's a file reference parameter. Uh, it takes a URL and all it goes for. And sorry about the bot not running and giving those links. I've just started it. I forgot to. Uh, so going, coming back onto this actual issue, I keep getting distracted from. Uh, they had a file reference. Basically, it's standard URL. Put in your own URL there. He was able to get uh, uh, SSRF. Not on every system. It was only, in this case, on the OneDrive import. But it, fairly straightforward, just it had a OneDrive URL or a OneDrive link. You could replace that with something else that would make the server side request. So he tried accessing the metadata API and didn't get it. Tried like 127, like localhost, also didn't get access to it. Um, and the trick that he found that worked in this case was using a uh, 303 redirect, which I thought was a little bit interesting because a lot of times when we talk about redirects, you're talking about here 301 and 302 redirects. That's usually what you're going to see your, your permanent and your temporary redirect. Um, so 303 is, um, uh, I, I should know that offhand, but now I can't recall what. HTTP 303 is see other. That's what it is. Um, it, it'll still do the redirect, but it's meant as a. So think about like if you make a file upload, you might redirect not to the actual content that was uploaded, but to a confirmation page. So that's where you might use 303. So I, I'd usually see on like APIs because it kind of carries that connotation of it rather than just temporary redirect and put you somewhere else. Uh, so I kind of wanted to call out just that trick being used there to use the 303 redirect. Um, and also just make mention of 307 and 308 being two other redirects kind of used in your own testing. Uh, usually when you redirect the body if the request is not kept, uh, it doesn't really matter for a get request, but with a post request, uh, you'll be able to and keep the body as it makes the redirect. So you're able to actually redirect an entire uh form post request for example uh, which is just a worthwhile trick to know about so what's worth mentioning here is they did try getting an rce um because using that 303 redirect uh trick to direct to an internal page they were able to extract um metadata for the aws instance so that includes like access tokens and stuff like that yeah that's the metadata api i was talking about yeah so they tried using the access token to execute instance commands, but they found that that token didn't have permissions. Um, and why I wanted to mention that was this is just another case where those fine-grained permissions can provide some nice defense in depth. 
Um, because if they didn't have their those permissions set up correctly, this could have been uh, a much worse issue. So the researcher did get a payout for this. Uh, they got a, I think it was a weird number. I think they got paid out $4,913. <laughs> I, I don't know what the reasoning is behind that weird number, but um, yeah, they, they did get paid out. Um, in terms of timeline, it was reported and fixed pretty quickly. <clears throat> it was reported on July 14th and it was fixed July 22nd. Um, but yeah, I was, I was interested uh, with the Dropbox Hacker One program. Uh, let me just bring that up because I don't actually have the link on hand for some reason. But um, their their report payouts are higher than I initially thought they might be. So if you go to their page here, you can see like RCE on the server. So if he was actually able to get RCE with that access token, it would have been a $32,000 payout. So um, and then like significant auth authentication bypass is 17K. So like their payouts here are really high. Um, much higher than I expected. Like you can even see on the right side, they paid out eight hundred and eighty-four thousand dollars worth of bounties. So, Although yeah, Dropbox might be add, a target you uh, might want to look at if you're looking to do bounties. Yeah, I will add this was in Hello Sign, which is something they call out specifically as, but not Hello Sign when it comes to these rewards. Um, they uh, say oh, they say yeah, in the paragraph enough. there, uh, Dropbox at, in core drop. Box application and Dropbox paper web app and server, but not Hello Sign. So I guess this was a specific case where they were willing to pay out for it, but uh, it doesn't mean they always will, I guess. Um, and that, that's probably why the payout was lower too. Like you can see in their reward table, the yeah, lowest I mean, one they have Sign, is cross site scripting is 12K. So it's not that Hello Sign isn't in scope, it's just those payouts are specifically for Dropbox Core. Uh, they have the Hello Sign. Uh, scope on this page also oh okay fair enough i didn't see that uh was that it's down oh, okay, here in nice. the bottom assets in scope okay so this was rated as a high issue there's the the 4913 i am really curious as to why they have these like such weird numbers like all their payouts have like uh like single digit numbers <laughs> i don't know why they don't just round Anyway, that's just a, a fun thing that I noticed. That it's neither here nor there. But. Um, there might be like a binary pattern to them. Oh, that yeah, that could be. Interesting. Um, I, I don't never know. Really thought to I look don't know offhand, of course, but because I mean, obviously, these aren't like just powers of two, so it's not that easy. Oh, yeah, could be some interesting pattern that a uh, maybe a listener, if they're interested enough, can can look into and let us know about. Actually, in the I guess thirty two seven sixty eight is one followed by several zeros so it's a nice round binary number so that is probably what they're doing here is just some binary fun yeah spoiling and then it see. <laughs> 17 576 has one four zeros one four zeros ah okay oh. z spoiled it <laughs> well there we go we, we got the answer at least um so silver peak so uh, there was an RCE involving three vulnerabilities in Silver Peak SD WAN orchestrator uh, that was published. Uh, this is a Java applet that runs on CentOS, I believe, is the uh, the setup they specify there. So it kicks off with an authentication bypass, which is the the most important issue. Um, essentially, they try to restrict API calls by the sender. Uh, Localhost is considered more privileged, so they don't have to use authentication. They can just kind of dance around it. Um, and the way they check for the sender is by using the HTTP host header, which is uh, and can be forged. So not, not a great check. So that that can lead you to spoof yourself as local host and allow you to access privileged endpoints that you shouldn't be able to reach. Um, the other two issues was a file delete path traversal through the debug logging endpoint. Uh, they provide an endpoint to delete logs, but they don't restrict the path. So you can just delete any file in the system that the applet has permissions to. And then finally, there's an endpoint to run arbitrary SQL queries. So they could use the dump file functionality to write arbitrary files. So by combining that with the arbitrary file delete, you can get uh, a file rewrite primitive. So by chaining all of those bugs together, they managed to overwrite a JavaScript file that gets executed. Uh, and they so use that to run shell commands. You only really get um, a file write privilege out of that. Uh, the reason why they need both is because you can't overwrite files using the into dump file. Yeah. Um, but you don't, you can't read it. At least not that way. I mean, if you've got arbitrary SQL, you should be able to import a file like 
into a column so you could probably get a read but like they didn't need a read write gadget here it's just the right gadget to get execution one thing i did i won't say in say it was interesting but one thing i did want to call out here is just this local host trick it's there have been more applications doing this than i wish that just look and kind of treat like oh you're running on local host so let's just pretend you're more secure somehow oh uh, example of that i don't know how long ago it was it was definitely like before microsoft took over github um like i want to say this maybe goes back even like 2010 or 2011 but github actually kind of did this the administrative panel could be accessed by forging the host header to look like you're coming from local hosts i think it was in particular of like the actual ip 127.0.1 um but I do remember, I'm pretty sure it was GitHub had a very similar vulnerability where you could access the administrative content uh, through that host header. That's crazy. I never knew about that. Today I learned. Um, but yeah, for those interested, they also did publish the exploit code in Python on GitHub. So if you wanted to take a look at it yourself or just take a look at some of the, the implementation of that exploit, that's available to you. Um, but yeah, ultimately... That first issue is the biggest problem because all these endpoints, the one that has the arbitrary file path delete and the arbitrary SQL query run, um, those are privileged endpoints. So this issue would be much less severe if they didn't do such a silly authentication check uh, that could be bypassed so easily for uh, uh, to be able to access those endpoints. So, Yeah, I mean, I guess if you have a reverse proxy running, it might rewrite the host headers so you can't forge it. Like, there are definitely some cases where you couldn't necessarily forge but i it's not a strong thing although i will also use to call out arbitrary sql it just shouldn't be a feature no <laughs> like i think should it's a really easy thing to do it's like okay you know the sysadmins want to know so let's just let them do whatever they want and you implement that like really wide feature and almost always that just becomes an avenue for an attacker um it's kind of like having a really soft or sorry really hard outside in this case not really because of the bypass but and then you just go really soft inside like as soon as you're compromised you're just completely owned and you want that defense in depth so not was, creating endpoints like that is a good idea i was gonna say this is like the opposite of defense in depth maybe we should coin a term for that have our have our own lore but i, I can't think of any off the top of my head that would be a good substitute for that um but yeah anyway yeah boils down a lot to that uh that authentication bypass so we'll move into what was probably the biggest story of the week when it comes to exploits uh getting root by pretending nobody's home so this was a decently trivial privilege escalation in ubuntu as far as privilege escalations go uh to the point where you don't even really need code to exploit it uh, which is mind-blowing because it's 2020. These these kinds of issues are pretty rare nowadays. So uh, breaking it down into steps, um, by linking the .pam environment file to the dev0 device, then changing the language of the system, um, that will freeze the account daemon. It will lock up and use 100% of its C uh, CPU core. You can then send a uh, stop signal to that daemon to stop it. And then you run a script on behalf of the user using nohep that'll sleep send a segmentation fault to the daemon, and then send a continue signal to it. And what that effectively does is it makes the daemon continue and then just hang, and it won't be able to respond to any request over the dbus. Um, so when you go to, when you log out and you go to log in again, um, it'll actually spawn a prompt to let you create a new user account, which you can give it admin privileges because it thinks it's in the initial setup phase. So this seems like kind of a weird process, like some of those weird glitches in video games. Um, but it makes a lot more sense when you look at the bugs that are involved. It essentially comes down to two bugs, a denial of service in the account service and a GNOME display manager bug. So the denial of service happens to do a bit of code that was added from Ubuntu into the account service process, which uh, checks for the PAM environment file I mentioned earlier. What happens is if you just link that to the zero device, it just hangs reading that forever. Um, and their bit of added code also drops the privileges of the daemon, 
which allows you to send a signal to it because normally you wouldn't be able to send signals to a privileged daemon but because it drops the privileges when it reads that pam environment file that's what allows you to send that sig seg v signal to it before uh hanging on the read so that explains the first four steps uh the last two come into play with the second bug the gnome display manager has an issue where it inquires the account statement for how many user accounts there are but because you uh hung the process it times out and when that timeout occurs it thinks that no user accounts exist on the system so that's why it lets you create a new one and thinks it's in the initial setup phase so yeah, and that's kind of the important aspect here is when gnome kind of sees like it's basically it's doing a lot of things that I, it's it should be doing i mean like it's not like the display manager here shouldn't show this prompt it's just it's handling this edge case where you have your normal login and it's like, oh, there are no accounts. Therefore, let's let you create your first account. And because of this denial of service, um, you actually do have accounts. It feels like, you know, part of that's a lack of error handling. Like it, if it times out, that should be different than getting a there are no accounts. Like those should be different events. But I could at least somewhat understand why a developer maybe wasn't thinking about, oh, debus my time out here. Yeah, I mean, just just sounds like an unconsidered edge case. Um, the, the funny thing is, as well, is that this issue is so obscure that the researcher found this issue by accident. So uh, he wasn't even intentionally like looking for an Ubuntu privesk when he found this. He just found it and investigated it and discovered that that was a route you could take to get root on the system. So a very cool bug. Like I said, it's it's very rare you see codeless LPEs like this. Um, so yeah, it's one of those diamonds in the rough, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's codeless, but that also makes it kind of difficult to exploit in cases where you'd probably want to exploit it, um, like servers that don't have a desktop environment installed. Um, even like, you know, remotely, you could do this over like a KVM. But you wouldn't be able to do this, I don't think, over like VNC. Uh, because they usually kind of go through their own login process. So it's so, definitely limited. Like it's limited to desktop users for the most part. I mean, there might be some obscure setup. I'm not going to say like there's no way possible, but generally it's only really desktop users that you're going to be able to use this against. Which is still a fair case. Like there are definitely, you know, kiosks would be an example where, you know, you're going to have a low privilege user and you can use it to escalate and you'd have like that desktop access or potentially. Yeah, that that is one thing that I uh kind of skipped over to mention was the fact that this does abuse the control panel, which is a little bit weird with how it handles the debus. Like I think normally you wouldn't be allowed to change the system language. But you can through the system panel because it's a more privileged process handling that that exposes that capability to the user. So, yeah, Ubuntu server, for example, wouldn't really be uh, vulnerable to this. So, Project Zero put out an interesting post. Usually, they put out uh, technical write ups for like kernel exploits and stuff like that. In this case, uh, they put out a little bit of a write up about a kernel bug, but it was it was more of a story uh, type post by Brandon Azad. Um, and this was about a bug that Azad missed and thought should have been obvious to him when he was looking at a subsystem. So this is an iOS-based bug. And he was looking for classes that were reachable from the sandbox, because Apple sandboxing is pretty strong. And anything that's reachable from the sandbox is infinitely more valuable than something that's uh, that's hittable from like a more privileged context. So he, he, was, he wrote a program to enumerate the IO user client classes, uh, which are reachable from that sandbox. And he found one that was interesting called H11 A&E Indirect Path Client, uh, which was a user client for the H11 A&E in driver. I'm not exactly sure what that driver is responsible for. I don't think he laid that out in the blog post, probably because it's, it's not really particularly relevant to the issue itself. Um, but part of why he found this driver interesting was the fact that it, it's not an open source driver. So it might be less audited and picked over. So um, more chances for, for issues to occur. So this driver had two clients. It had the H11 a &E indirect path client I mentioned, and it also had the H11 a &E in user client class. Uh, 
The user client one was more privileged and was not reachable from Sandbox, while the direct path client was less privileged and was reachable from the Sandbox. So he ended up confirming the code quality of the area was bad when he reversed it. Uh, he found mul multiple null pointer dereferences with a quick fuzzer he wrote for it. Um, but because there were null pointer dereferences and they weren't really that interesting, he didn't want to investigate the driver much further. So he basically just reported the driver as an area of concern to Apple. Um, but one thing he found interesting on the way was the fact that uh, the method tables, he thought they were being shared between the two classes due to the similarity. And the, the funny thing was, was those method tables were not supposed to be shared. There was actually an out of bounds access in the method accessor due to a type confusion. Um, I think the code presumed that the object was the more privileged one, even when it wasn't. So the underprivileged class could access 33 methods when it should have only been able to access two. Um, and the, the part that's really funny is the fact that the null pointer dereference that he found abused this issue in the background and he just didn't realize it. So, yeah, um, um I kind of want to jump back a little bit on that. Um, his reasoning, like, I really kind of liked reading through this because as he's coming across this, he explains why he was looking, or, well, you already hit on why he was looking at these functions, but he explains how usually you're going to have this uh, function table, like these exposed methods to the IO client. Um, those exposed methods are usually going to be, like you'll have the class, you'll have the class V table, you'll have these methods. And in this case, this one, in, uh, or these two classes, I guess, technically, um, had the uh, exposed methods kind of back to back. Uh, and that's where he came up with this reasoning that okay they must be sharing a lot of functionality and there are just these few that are only used by the one and as you're reading through the article like he gives you the reasoning it's like yeah they're probably doing it for this and it's only at the end does he give you that reveal that okay actually that whole reasoning that he made up was just wrong and i mean that happens when you do smarty you try and understand the code you try and understand why the code is doing what it's doing in this case, it was doing what it's doing because of a copy and paste bug where uh, copied and pasted code that would work on like from one of the clients to the other didn't change one of the values. Uh, Did, so that, I think it didn't change it like a cast or something. So that's where the type confusion came into play. Yeah, I mean, well, he talks about the selector. Um, it, it comparing the selector against the wrong count. Oh, OK. Uh, but that's not really the huge issue here. I just thought it was a good read because of that reveal at the end. I feel like you just kind of skipped right to that reveal. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, yeah, this this is one of those like rabbit hole, uh, going down the rabbit hole cases that you hear about a lot in security, but they don't really get written up a lot. Um, people just say, oh, I was trying to investigate this and I went down this rabbit hole and I wasted like eight hours and then I found this really easy other path or I missed uh, this other easy thing. Um, but you don't really hear about the technical details of those rabbit holes. So yeah, that was a really cool part of this post. Um, and, and it's just one of those examples where even the best of researchers can miss stuff that seems trivial in hindsight. You know, that uh, the hindsight's twenty twenty saying uh, is really, really applicable here. Well, but I think this one really comes down to that, you know, reverse engineering aspect. You're often, you're when you're reading it, you're trying to understand what the code's doing, of course. You're trying to understand why the why if and why the code is doing this, and you come up with a reason for it. So when it has this sort of more subtle issue, you just assume that they intended to do that, and you make off like why, like a plausible reason why, and that's kind of what he mentions here. Um, that that is like his takeaway. He did the mental gymnastics to give a reason for what it was doing when he should have just recognized it as a bug. Yeah, it's what makes uh, reverse and or um, vulnerability research from a, I guess, gray box would be the term. So not having access to source code, but doing it from the binaries perspective. In some ways, it can be easier to look for bugs because you're you're looking at the raw assembly. You're, you don't have as many levels of indirection as you do with something like C++. But this is something that's on the other side of the scale where it's like um, that information being hidden away from you can easily obscure what's actually going on. So 
Yep. It's one of it's one of the struggles that you can deal with when you're dealing with uh reverse engineering based vulnerability research. And it's it's cool to see that coming out of people like P0, where it's it's easy to think of P0 as like godlike figures that never make mistakes because they're just they're so good at what they do. But it, it you know, this shows that it's it's easy to miss stuff like this. So finishing off with exploits, we have a hardware attack. Uh and uh as so as per usual, we like kicking to Intel you, while it's but down. We missed one topic there about Bitdefender. We totally did. Thank you. I I have no idea how I skipped over that. Okay, so we'll, we'll revisit Intel in a little bit. We'll cover Bitdefender first. Thanks for bringing that up, Z. Um, so ten memory corruptions were discovered in Bitdefender, uh, specifically when it comes to unpacking executables packed with UPX. So antiviruses will implement unpacking feature sets to try to combat some of the common packers that might be used by malware authors to try to evade uh, antivirus. One of these packers is UPX. So the blog post gives some background on how UPX is unpacked and the general process behind it. Um, but of course, since you're talking about parsing a format, for <laughs> parsing errors are like the most common bugs to exist, I think. So it's a, it's a primary to look. And antiviruses are also juicy targets because they usually they have to run at an elevated level of privilege to run. So they're a privilege escalation vector. So I'm not going to talk about all 10 issues. Uh, you're free to look at it if you want to look at the link in the description. Um, but I'm I will talk about three of them that I found interesting. Um, and I, I know Z found one interesting as well. So I'll let you talk about uh, the int the issue you found interesting, Z, and then I'll talk about my three. Yeah, well, it's not so much I didn't find others interesting, but I did just want to call one kind of anti-pattern that I noticed. Um, and that's in the very first one here, the stack-based buffer overflow, pre-extraction, deobfuscation. Um, and what this does is, is it's basically iterating over uh, uh, the bytes here, the operations that need to be performed. And in theory, it should just be doing more or less one step at a time and it kind of makes this assumption in a couple cases like it'll break out on 16 bytes you hit 16 let's leave so what's interesting in this case or the pattern here is the fact that it goes kind of like if this case do this if this do this um you know if this bites this do this like it just has a bunch of if statements one after the other and this the issue here the overflow would not have happened had they simply um, used if else or used switch statements to make some of those comparisons. Uh, so I just kind of want to call that out as one of those common problems when you see those back to back ifs, there's a fair, ch especially in processing something, there's a fair chance you can mess around with the iterators a bit. Um, and that's exactly what happened here. They were able to basically get to increment twice then when it does the later, you know, if you're at exactly 16, that ends up breaking because they they were able to get uh, the I value or the index value to increment twice before actually reaching there. So I wanted to call out the second issue, which was a heap up or overflow in the pre-extraction deobfuscation. Um, I, I thought this one was interesting because it's induced via uninitialized field in a structure. So they compare a they compare a user provided write offset against an unnamed field in the extract object, presumably like a size or a length. Um, but that field never gets initialized. So there's a hole in the stack. So if you can stack spray, you can influence that size and just negate that check entirely. And why I like uninitialized use uh, bugs is because it's easy to look at this code if you're doing like source uh, source code review and just assume okay this is good it does bounds checking. Um, you know, the, the, the signness or whatever looks correct of the, uh, of the variables involved. And because like this code technically would be correct if that field was initialized, it's one of those less obvious bugs where you would have to go out of the way to look at that object and in initialization and see, okay, it's actually being set up properly. Um, so it's just one of those things that's, that's easy to miss. Um, the third issue I thought was kind of cool, less because of the um the heap buffer overflow itself and and more because of the fact that they use a user provided length for xoring against an unrelated size um so they they check the size of the raw data instead of the extracted data buffer so what this allows you to do is xor bytes out of bounds of the extracted data 
And this is really cool because the XOR itself is particularly relevant. Um, normally in four loop based out of bounds, right, which is what this is, you end up smashing data, right? Um, you don't get a precise controlled out of bounds right there. But in this case where you can use XOR, um, you know, you can just use XOR to skip bytes and only smash the bytes you want to hit. So that, that makes this issue like a lot more exploitable and probably stable. So, and it, it's kind of like a CTF aspect, you know, using XOR to exploit something. That's not something you really see in the real world all that often. So I thought that was kind of a cool issue. Um, so the final issue was the heap overflow and rebuilding resources. This one was a little bit more trivial. Uh, they don't check the dir size when they pass a size mem copy when rebuilding the resource table. Um, so this one is another example of a for loop based uh, issue, but it's not as controllable. So they submitted all these bugs to the bounty. Um, they didn't put what they got in those uh, in those reports, so I can't really comment on that too much. But yeah, a few issues that I found uh, really interesting. Um, now I, I hear I'm having audio issues. I yeah, am gonna you're coming through really fuzzy. So I think, are you able to cover the boot guard vulnerability? Because I'll, I'll mute my mic for a sec and try to yep. see if I can do anything about that. Yeah, so I guess I'll start on the boot guard here. Um, this one, it's a sleep attack. So, sorry, I wasn't planning to be the one covering this issue, but this will allow a local attacker with physical access to the SPI flash chip uh, to effectively perform a talk to attack or a time of check, time of use against boot guard. Uh, which is basically just protecting your system. It, it'll do signature checks, basically making sure you're booting the proper system. Um, and it's super easy to kind of understand. I think this report goes into a lot of details, a lot of background that maybe you don't need. Uh, but the gist of this one is it does, on a normal boot, the firmware will, will validate the contents of the SPI flash and it'll validate to make sure they're signed. However, when you resume from a sleep, it just doesn't do that check whatsoever. So you have it checked at the beginning, and then when you resume, it just assumes that it's still okay. Uh, so that means if you resume from a sleep, you're going to be able to gain very early, or sorry, if you get, if you gain control of a PC or a computer that is in that sleep mode, you're going to be able to gain very early code execution because you can just replace the SPI with whatever you want, any code you want at that level. So then you're able to skip any sort of operating system protection or disable them outright. You're able to look for sensitive information in memory. Uh, the example that they provide here is being able to read like the Lux here, BitLocker encryption keys. Um, and that's just because even if those keys are generally going to be wiped uh, from memory, because you're dealing with this or uh, at the code execution level, so rather than just reading memory, so one of the concerns that would get raised or that I saw raised by a few people is, well, why wouldn't you just read the memory? If you have this physical, uh, you have this physical access to the device, you should be able to go ahead and just read the memory, dump the memory, and find these encryption keys. So even if they're wiped here, because it's going to be loading up some of that information after the sleep, because you control the code there, you're able to still read them. Um, so it can be quite powerful. It does require the physical access. It does require you're in sleep. But the great example they give of that is you have your laptop, you're on a flight, you close the laptop lid, your laptop goes into sleep mode. And then when you go through security uh, after your flight, like if you just cross the international border, you're going to clear customs. At that point, customs would be to recover all of your keys or all of your access. I don't know, Spectre, are you back on here? Yeah, so I, I tried to try to fix it a little bit, but I, I imagine it's still coming through. Uh, no, for that, it's, I apologize. Yeah, it's still coming through. Yeah. Um, one part, I did step away for a second, so apologies if I'm, I'm kind of re-mentioning this, but uh, another part that I found interesting was the fact that the SM RAM for system management mode is also unlocked during the resume. So those modules can also be overwritten and you can essentially get a rootkit in SMM um, until the next hard reboot. So that, that's kind of an interesting uh, point as well. Um, so this is a physical attack, like you said, which limits its usability. 
The other uh, part, like scenario they mentioned other than airport security was also like a hardware implant. Um, they said you could implant something on the motherboard and you could do it in a way that looks inconspicuous. Um, and that, that would be like an interesting vector as well, though probably less likely to happen than even the airport security one. Um, now in classic Intel fashion, when they initially reported this issue, it was dismissed as not a bug. <laughs> um, but then they, they eventually reopened it. Uh, at, they speculated it was after pressure from the OEMs and uh, they did fix it. Uh, they they say that they're not sure how they fixed it because Intel didn't disclose any details, which they often don't do with these types of issues. But um, it, it was fixed. Um, how well it was fixed remains to be seen. Maybe we'll see another post come up like a month or two down the line that talks about uh, um, how this the their fix could be bypassed. But uh, yeah, we'll have to wait yeah, and see on it, that. It always feels like Intel tends to downplay their issues and just be... Like their descriptions don't nest like they might be technically accurate, but they don't really capture the spirit of the issue and how damaging they can be. Yeah. So we can move on to research. So there was a new attack published last week at ACM CCS 2020, and it is a side channel attack against DNS, uh, which can facilitate DNS cache poisoning. So from what I understand, the, the basics of DNS cache poisoning and how it works is you become an off-path attacker who injects spoof DNS responses to the uh, to the forwarder or the or the name server or whatever. Uh, and to prevent these kinds of attacks, there's been mitigations added since Kaminsky first demonstrated uh, this attack in 2008. One of those is randomizing the source port. So before, where it used to be a constant, unchanging source port, like 53 was the example they gave for communicating with name servers, the port is randomized. So that's on top of a 16-bit ID that was also added. So those two layers together add a lot of entropy for trying to brute force um, spoofing those DNS responses. So I don't believe the query ID was actually added. I believe that's been part of it from the outset. It's just that was the only thing you had to spoof back in 2008 with Kaminsky's attack. Um, now, yeah. because browsers will generally, or well, open resolvers, basically everything will generally try and randomize the port that's using to make the initial request. Now, you, when you're spoofing the UDP packet, you also have to get that right. Otherwise, the operating system isn't going to match um, match the incoming request. Um, and then the query ID is there for the DNS process to actually match the request. And be like, okay, this is a response to this request that I sent out. Yeah. So what this attack abuses is the networking stack in operating systems like Linux to leak that source port via a side channel. And it, it utilizes the fact that ICMP rate limits are predictable to check if any of the ports in a burst of packets are open. So the example Cloudflare gives is if you send 10,000 packets to scan 10,000 ports and the server had a rate limit of 50 per second, then the first 50 would return port unreachable if all the ports in uh, that initial first 50 range were all closed. If one was open, they would receive an ICMP response. Now, normally this isn't a huge problem because you wouldn't know which port uh, was open in that ICMP response, but by utilizing the knowledge of the limit and how many ports you're trying to hit, you can basically abuse this to check which ports are open. So for example, you can use this attack with a set of known closed ports and one port you want to check, and then just utilize the fact that if you get an ICMP response, you know that port is open. Um, so there are some additional barriers to that attack. Uh, for one, you have to discover the initial VIP in the first place, which is kind of a given. Um, it may not always be easy. For two, uh, you need a decent max rate limit on the server side, or else your scan speed will be unreasonably slow. And the other thing they mention is uh, ephemeral ports um, can also be a problem. So those are short-lived ports that are open, used, and then closed, and then another one is opened. Um, so you know you have a bit of a timing. You have a timing issue there where you have to basically race the server uh, to be yeah, able to use that port. The race has always kind of been the case. Um, they actually do talk about uh, another attack using fragmentation. It's from like 2012, so I'm not going to go quite into it. But like the race. Be because effectively what you're doing with the DNS cache poisoning is the request goes out and you're always racing the response. At the very least, that race is always going to exist. 
you want to get your attack response in there before the authoritative response. So th this was a cool attack. Um, side channels are always fun to talk about. And unlike some of the side channels we've covered in the past, this one seems like a, a much more practical attack that can be pulled off, which is always fun to see because we always have to have that caveat when we talk about a lot of side channels that, hey, this is cool, but it, it's, you need like physical access or whatever, and it's probably not really going to be used in any serious context. But this one is does have more practical implications. So that's, that's always nice to uh, to be able to talk about. Um, yeah, although this has been resolved in like the major like 1.1.1.1 1 .1 .1 .1 1 .1 is has resolved this as has google with quad 8 um so and that's just you know setting a decent response or rate limit so it's fairly low is sufficient as a mitigation for this like I said because it will take quite a while to find that port so linux i actually took a look at the linux patch the way that they fixed this issue in the uh, the Linux DNS stack was they randomized the maximum, uh, the max rate limit. So it's not predictable anymore. So it could be like 50 or it could be 75 or it could be whatever. Um, so that I thought that was kind yeah, of a cool approach that Linux took. Yeah. Just adding more randomization. Randomize the port, randomize this. Randomize all the things. Um, Effectively, though, this is a mitigation bypass. Um, Cloudflare even points out here that without strong cryptographic authentication, it will always be possible to use spoofing to poison DNS resolvers if somebody's willing to or able to jump through enough hoops. So this essentially is just another stopgap measure. It's it's another hoop they're adding on there with randomization. Theoretically, it is still possible to jump through it. It's just uh, it's just harder to do now. So. Cache in the middle. So <laughs> keeping on the side channel train, we have uh, manipulating sensitive data in isolated execution environments on, uh, I believe this this one focuses on ARM. Now, I'll let Z take this one away because he managed to give it a more thorough reading than I did. But I will preface this by saying apologies if we make any mistakes covering this topic. This is probably the most complex topic we've had in a very long time. <laughs> Uh, it's it's in an area that neither of us really specialize in, and it's one of those areas where if you're not familiar with it, you are going to have a hard time parsing through this. So, um, yeah, just wanted to preface that up front. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you continue, Z. Yeah, good disclaimer, because this paper, like, in doing prep for this episode, I probably spent the most time, I probably spent more time on this paper than everything else combined, and I still don't entirely get it, I guess. Uh, but I did kind of want to cover it anyhow. Um, and I mean, cache attacks are not something I've dealt with. This isn't really a standard cache attack, to be fair. Uh, but what this does, cache in the middle. So you, that kind of gives you a sense of what's going on here. The idea here is attacking uh, trusted execution environment applications, uh, attacking those by attacking the cache, uh, getting basically poisoning the information in the cache so that when the secure world maybe reads it, um, it's going to be reading data you control, or uh, you're going to be able to read data from the secure world that should have been cleared but wasn't. And they do this, they cover kind of three different attacks in this. Um, and I guess one important term here is IEE, isolated execution environment. Uh, that's something they introduced uh, effectively to deal with OEMs wanting to reduce kind of the attack surface by limiting the number of secure applications or third party secure applications that could be developed. And of course, third party application developers want to have the freedom to install their own applications that would also execute in the secure world. So their solution on that is their IEE, um, isolate execution environments uh, in the normal world to protect kind of certain security sensitive applications that you can just, you can install these applications yourself. Um, and I will say about this paper, Usually, I'm able to kind of go and look at kind of some of the summaries and get a good understanding of how the attacks work. And this paper does cover its three attacks, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Very descriptive names, I know. Um, covers the three attacks with these summary paragraphs. But if you're going to give this paper a read, 
I wouldn't spend too much time trying to understand those summaries and just dive right to the case studies. Each of these attacks is paired with a case study that looks at an actual application that they were able to attack using a type one, type two, and type three vulnerability. It becomes a lot more clear when you see the actual attacks versus sitting there trying to understand understand it from the summary. But as I was mentioning, there are three issues that they bring up. One is manipulating core isolate memory during concurrent execution. So that is the trust, in some cases, the trusted application, um, or there's basically two operating modes. Trusted applications or secure applications can run, uh, basically if one of them is running, no unsecure application can be running, or no unsecure application can be running on the same core. So where this, where this type one attack comes in is when you have a unsecure application running on a different core and a secure application running on you know, whatever core. Uh, usually there should be kind of a isolated memory, you know, the core isolated memory um, between the cores. So while the IE is running, any of the cache lines that represent the secure memory will be tagged as non-secure. Um, and that's kind of the key thing through a lot of these issues. What they're generally trying to find are places where the cache is still going to be tagged as not secure, but the memory has already been turned to secure or isn't being changed as in one of the cases. Uh, but that's kind of the key issue. It's about finding those places where cache lines are still insecure, uh, but the memory has actually changed, changed place or changed its security attribute. Um, so again, in this case, in the first case, um, if the memory is cacheable, which again is another configuration there, um, if it's not cacheable, then you can't really do attacks on the cache. Uh, just outright can't do that. Uh, while the IE is running, so while that isolate application is running in the normal world, um, all of those cache lines get changed over to not secure, as I mentioned. So that means that during that period, the normal operating system can go ahead and manipulate them by crafting its own little page table entry that points to the core isolated memory, like wherever that's located um, on hardware. And it could read that and it can control some of that data to get its own data into the cache uh, just during that period. Um, because it thinks it's not secure. Those cache lines are not secure. Uh, the second attack, I thought was just a little bit more interesting. Uh, what ends up happening is when the secure memory, or when you're switching between like a secure application running and secure application running, it should be clearing memory to say, hey, this memory, you know, let's zero it out before somebody's able to read it. Uh, what this one of the ways this goes about attacking that is to look at locking some of the cache out so you can't actually or so it can't be evicted. Uh, so why that matters is sometimes when you're writing memory, it's not necessarily going to change memory directly. It's going to write that to the cache and then eventually once your CPU cache gets evicted or like once that way gets evicted, then it writes it to actual memory. So if you can prevent something from actually getting evicted, you can prevent that write from actually going through to the actual memory. Which again, which then leads to the case of if no eviction happens, it doesn't overwrite the sensitive memory, allowing for uh, the non-secure application to potentially read it. And then the third one, which I had to spend a lot more time trying to get into, uh, just happens with inappropriate cache clearing. So it's kind of similar with the last one, but um, in this case, data kind of leaking. Um, Maybe it was during um, context switches? Was, well, yeah, that, that's what it does mention there. It's They kind of switch between using context switching and the switch out. Unfortunately, I've lost my summary for this one, so I'm trying to quickly refresh myself. Okay, no worries. Um, so what I was kind of gleaming from, uh, your statements there, especially with the, the first type of issue was it's abusing the fact that multiple CPU cores can share the same cache. So for those not, uh, like super familiar with chip layouts, 
I believe how it works is each core will have its own L1 cache, which is pretty small, but it's really fast. Um, and then multiple cores will share an L2 cache inside of a cluster, which is a bit slower, but um, it's bigger. And then you have the L3 cache, which is shared between clusters, which is a lot bigger, but also a lot slower than L1 and L2. So I believe these types of attacks are mostly happening on the L2 and L3 caches. Um, I, I'm not super confident on the type two and type three, if that's also happening there, but at least from what I hear and what the little bit that I've read of the paper, I believe it's mostly hitting those, uh, that those like middle caches, the L2 cache, which is yes, probably I where the name comes from. Don't believe it actually hits the, or it doesn't make any mention of the L3 cache. It only mentions L1 and L2 uh, okay. throughout the paper. Okay, cool. Uh, that's it. I did just pull up uh, kind of a graph here, which tries to sort of explain this last attack. Uh, but the idea here is, um, and they use trust ice as the example case, is that memory is kind of dynamically, the security attributes of the memory are dynamically set. The new application launches, um, the allocate or it gets allocated a memory region that's set to non-secure. It's running over in the uh, normal world. That's why it's non-secure, so it can actually access it. Um, it runs once it finishes running. Once it finishes running, then it'll reconfigure that same region back to being secure, and then hands control back to a normal world application. So where the issue happens is that. Even though the memory itself is being marked as secure and the memory region is being marked as secure, if there's something in cache, that will still be marked as a non-secure cache, uh, which means that you're able to skip some of the checks. So in this case, uh, the graph kind of shows us here with little X's on number three for the external board. It talks kind of a little bit more about this process and what G-Service is. But the idea here is basically if you don't have that cache miss, it sees it as being a non-secure cache, and it doesn't see a reason to encrypt that data again when it leaves um, or clear that data either way. So you're able to get to skip that process, and then from normal world, you can go ahead and read uh, your data. And that's kind of the three attacks that I've probably butchered the full details on. Of Honestly, as you did a lot better of a job than I would have, so... <laughs> as a paper like there are definitely some interesting points this is an area that i kind of want to dig into like just the lower level and also the trusted execution environment and like applications running in the secure world um it's kind of an area i want to dig into so i did find the paper interesting i like i mentioned though like it's summary there i don't think did a good job um maybe it's just my lack of understanding and lack of background on it but I did find like the actual case studies though to be an interesting uh read now I i'll point out these attacks do require kernel access from insecure world uh for example with the type one attack i believe you had to craft page table entries with physical addresses which you certainly cannot do from untrusted user land yeah no this so... is this is always a like it's assuming you've got complete control of the operating system to attack the trusted execution environment. Yeah. That said, those types of attacks are exactly what trusted execution environments are designed to prevent against. They are in the threat model. Um, I, I did just want to point that out though. It's not like some of the, you know, speculative execution attacks we've talked about, for example, where in certain specialized cases, you could even potentially hit it from user land. That's not the case in these attacks. These are, um, like Z said, they re they require complete control of the operating system. Um, so we'll move into our last topic of the day, which is a systematic study of elastic objects and kernel exploitation. So by elastic here, I assume they mean like dynamically sized, um, an object that has like a, an array or something in it that you can control the length of. Um, yeah, they go ahead and actually uh, define it uh, one stage here. Uh, yeah, what is, at the end of page, uh, page two of this thing there, what is an elastic object? Basically, yeah, has a length field that controls the size of an elastic kernel buffer. So fairly common setup. I will say elastic is not something I've really heard as a term being used in, in the kernel world. Yeah, so. I was wondering the same <laughs> thing when I first saw it. Like, what yeah, is I've never it? seen I, that used in kernel. I context. googled elastic kernel object and I got this paper. <laughs> 
Yeah, so it seems like something they kind of uh, coined. It, 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 I don't think it's an established term, but anyway. Um, their main goals of this project are to try to automatically discover these elastic objects, as they call them, and match them to vulnerability scenarios that can facilitate useful primitives for attackers. So defeating KSLR, for example, um, leaking heap canaries, or even developing some more complex primitives, such as an arbitrary read. So Sorry, the heap canaries or staff canaries? Uh, I they say heap canaries. Which oh, do they? I, was... I would think of heap. Uh, so I would think of leaking the stack canaries. I think I was yeah, definitely reading it's that. Yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, I, I was thinking that too. I was thinking maybe they mistyped, but they do say heap canaries, or Fair they enough. say heap slash stack cookies. So maybe it's just something I haven't really encountered in my kernel exploitation adventures, or maybe it's something that is possible to enable, but just most things don't. Um, but yeah, so. Basically, the concept of using dynamically influenced heap objects for exploitation, um, that concept is not new. Uh, in fact, the Android binder issue we covered a year ago abused the IOVEX structure kind of for this purpose. It's not an elastic object as they would define it, but it suits the same kind of purpose. Um, so heap objects you can influence the size of are infinitely useful for UAS scenarios, but they, the paper also points out they can be useful for other bug classes like out of bounds, read and write. That's where they really uh, put their eggs in is the uh, heap overflow aspect. So how they try to look for elastic objects is by flattening the structure so they convert multi-dimensional arrays to single dimensional. Uh, they pull out unions and, and rewrite the object and they look for integer fields um, marking. And if they find an integer field, they mark that object as a candidate object. Now they do do some further uh, narrowing down to try to check for which functions allocate that object. And they look for privilege checks and whatnot to make sure it can actually be called from an unprivileged context. Um, and they have to ensure that that candidate integer field is really a size. Cause obviously an integer doesn't have to be a size. It can be like a, it can be anything, right? It can be like an accessor or whatever. So how they do that is they look at the cross-references of that field to see how it's used. So if it's passed as a size to an anchor function that they recognize, for example, or in a size space operation, they confirm that it's an elastic object. Um, and then they finally profile that and classify the object by where they're allocated. So is it allocated in like a general kmalloc cache or is it zone allocated? Uh, what caches can it hit? So yeah, they, they profile that and basically build the database of these objects. And once they have that database, they use constraint solving with the object against the modeled capability of the vulnerability in question. Basically what I think they're doing there is they're checking the size discrepancies of the object the vulnerability is based on and the elastic object that would get sprayed. And they try to solve whether or not the original vulnerability would be able to mess with that elastic object, specifically the, the length field. Um, <clears throat> So in their evaluation section, they found they were able to find 74 elastic objects, 60 of which could be reached from unprivileged. Um, now, the results were a little bit weird in this paper. They had to keep their tables short. It seems they had a page limit, which is why after page like 11, I believe, uh, or actually 13, they have like a bunch of additional pages with stats that could be interesting, but maybe aren't technically considered part of the paper. Um, if you go all the way down to page 18, uh, they have this table seven, <clears throat> which has a, a massive list of CVE IDs and syscaller IDs for issues um, that they tested against and tried to match uh, elastic objects to. So when they evaluated 40 vulnerabilities, 31 in Linux, 6 in XNU, and 3 in FreeBSD, they found their tool was able to bypass KASLR and heap canary protection in 27 of the 40 cases. So that is kind of promising um, and also seems reasonable. You know, it's it's not all of them, but it is over half. Um, I think this is a really interesting approach, though, and it's one that I hadn't really thought of. Uh, I think this is one of those papers that could have a cool practical implication. Um, now, obviously, this does focus more on the exploit dev side of things. This doesn't really help you at all when it comes to vuln discovery or, or uh, like fuzzing or anything like that. Um, but it can definitely, well, maybe you could integrate it fuzzing with uh, doing like automated triaging or something, but. Well, it also, um, um, I mean, you're saying it helps with the exploit dip, but it also makes it harder. I mean, there is the entire mitigation that they suggest in here, which is, 
uh, their Section 6 defense mechanism, uh, which essentially just has the idea of uh, isolating these elastic objects into their own region, essentially. Essentially, it calls it the shadow. They call it the shadow cache. Yeah, shadow cache, where you would shadow have realm. the... Well, I mean, it, it's similar, like, with the shadow stack. It's doing a similar thing. Well, not quite, but um, in this case, it would be storing those elastic objects off on their own. Uh, so the case that they're worried about is using, like, an over... Uh, re or out-of-bound read. Using that to, say, leak a file operations pointer is the example that they give, but to leak code pointers, effectively. Uh, so by putting them all in their own region, you're not leaking code pointers anymore. You're just leaking other elastic objects if you do a slight overread on it. Or out of bound read, sorry. Yeah, I think shadow cache is not the best term. I think isolated cache is a lot more descriptive there. Yeah, and they um, even call it like when they're talking about the regions like K dash or K alloc dash isolated dash sixteen. Um, yeah, like okay. they even use isolated there, but I'm pretty sure when they're talking about, they say shadow. So basically, they they create these uh, isolated caches for all of the common K malloc caches. So K malloc, uh, si like sixteen, eight, sixteen, thirty two, sixty four, whatever. Um, they have an isolated one that's adjacent to it. I, I think that's a that's a reasonable idea. I, I don't know if that'll actually really take off, or if you know Linus will let that happen. Uh, and come to the kernel. Um, but I, I'd i like to see this ap uh, applied to more types of scenarios. Like, I'd love to see this type of research applied to more UAF type stuff. You know, evaluating objects for UAF rights, for example. Um, this is kind of adjacent to that, but I think there could be more work done on that side. And uh, that would be really cool. Um, also, the angle that I, I didn't think of initially when reading the paper, but I thought of while I was talking about it, was that potentially integrating it with the fuzzing. Uh, we talked about a paper before that tried to evaluate the capability of out of bounds rights, I think, um, by yeah, automatically Kobe. exploiting them. Kobe, yeah. Um, I feel like this could also help in that area, uh, automatically taking vulnerabilities found by fuzzing and, and using these candidate objects to try to exploit them. Um, taking a question out of chat, any database of these 74 objects somewhere, I, I don't believe they link to one or have one. Um, you would probably have to take the research and apply it and, and build your own database. Um, but yeah, I, I think this does show some promise when it comes to practical applications. So um, yeah, I think this is a cool paper. Uh, did you have any final thoughts on it, Z? No, I've said what I wanted to. Okay, cool. So that concludes all the topics we have for this episode. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VODs on Twitch or on YouTube at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday after the stream. We also have previous podcasts up on Anchor, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Um, once again, I'll shout out that we'd love some feedback to improve the podcast. Uh, you can join our Discord and leave any feedback you have in the podcast feedback channel or in the YouTube comment section, whichever one is more convenient for you. Um, but yeah. And we may be putting out a form next week uh, that uh, has like more concise questions and stuff, uh, and we'd, we'd love any responses to that. With that out of the way, though, we'll be back again next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, and we will see you all then.